Oh, good morning and uh, welcome to our first steps webinar on digital body language. I'm Matt Borg. I'm one of the senior leaders at Actian and Brio. And we've been working in learning and development uh, for uh, about 40 years, helping learning make a real difference within organizations. And I, I, I think you probably agree with me, the shift to virtual classroom has been one of the more rapid and massive changes that we've that we've seen during that period. So we started this series of webinars uh, really aiming to upskill and equip learning and development professionals to help you make the most of this opportunity to meet the challenges, uh, but really to help you design and plan and deliver really impactful live virtual classroom sessions. So we've asked Joe Cook uh, of Lightbulb Moment to share her insight and expertise with us this morning. Um, Joe's not a newcomer to virtual learning. She's been a leading expert on the subject since about 2013. She's got a thousand hours of uh, facilitation experience. She's worked across all the different tools and platforms, hundreds of organizations. And so Joe really is a perfect person to help us navigate these first steps into virtual. Before I hand over to Joe, can I just encourage you to focus not only on the content of today's webinar, hopefully we'll have some really useful content for you, but also on the conduct. Um, focus on learning from a really experienced facilitator and seeing how Joe runs the session. Now, this is a very large group uh, and, and so very much a webinar, but hopefully you'll be able to learn some things that you can take into the virtual classroom uh, just by watching to see how Joe uh, runs the session this morning. Joe, thanks for leading us. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Matt. That was really lovely. And I love that distinction between our virtual classroom and our webinar. Now, I wouldn't be anywhere if I didn't have my producer today, Mike. He's in the chat. If you've got any questions, you can let him know. He's also going to share all sorts of links and uh, useful bits and pieces for you. Uh, so you can drop him a message anytime. He's the business operations manager here at Lightbulb Moment. And if you're thinking, hang on, a minute how come you've got the same last name it's because he's my brother and we run light bulb moment together so before we move into our content today let's make sure we can communicate properly in this webinar we do have the chat window today if you haven't done so already move your mouse on the screen click that chat speech bubble and you will have your chat window appear now zoom what it does <clears throat> is it sets your chat to all panelists and that's great that will come through to me and matt and mike but it's going to be a busy webinar i might not see all of those messages and you probably want it set to everyone so please make sure you click that little drop down menu and you choose all panelists and attendees and then you can chat amongst yourselves share stuff uh, and we can get a really great discussion going so our agenda today, we've got a few things to get through. We're going to talk first of all about physical body language and the importance of, of that. We're also going to talk then about digital body language, the point of this whole webinar. And we're going to then look at, well, how do we deconstruct what we do face to face? Uh, we're going to talk about webcams. We're going to talk about virtual classrooms in a bit more detail. And of course, about how we adapt our delivery from what we used to, to virtual classrooms. How about a quick okay in chat please if you're thinking this looks good so okay in chat if this looks good oh look at all those okays and smiles and perfect wonderful in which case we shall move on thank you so much so let's start thinking about this topic by looking at body language that we all know and love already. We know it's all about interpreting non-verbal communication from people we're dealing with. And it's important in our work, our teaching, our training, our facilitation, whichever kind of word you want to use to apply to your practice. Now, what I'd like to know, please, is a bit more about what you rely on with regards 
body language and the connection face to face. So please pop that in chat. What is it that you rely on? Now this is going to be very fast paced. I'm going to pick out some things as we go through. Uh, we've got eye contact, smiling, facial expressions, nods, posture, she says sitting up straight, uh, mannerisms, nodding, uh, smiling again, uh, hands, yes, hand gestures can make such a difference. Understanding and pausing when someone is going to speak. I don't do that very well, pausing and let other people speak, but I do try to, it's an important thing. Uh, a laughing manner, says calm so sometimes that lightness that energy can be really good and joanne says that too that sense of energy from people uh, it could be tone of voice uh, <laughs> nothing says neither do i the breath mm, that's an interesting one um so is that kind of about taking a breath is it about um is it well, i'm not really sure john you'll have to tell us a bit more about that uh breathing cue says maddie you need to tell me a little bit more about that in chat uh, it could be if they're tapping away at something else yeah if they've got like a, a pen that they're kind of annoying or something like that uh, so John says it could be about the rhythm and the patterns of their breathing so I'm guessing that could tell you about their passion or anxiety or just if they're really calm and into the subject or attentive something like that showing you're interested active listening showing happiness all of this stuff is looking really great their energy levels pace of speech and um, eye movements that's a really good one claire <laughs> the eye roll i try not to do that frowns maybe their eyes widening their direction of gaze all really good uh, whether it's a welcoming impression uh, it could be just walking among the class daniel that's a really good one and that that's great isn't it if we've got somebody who's maybe quiet or maybe somebody who's not quiet and we want them to be quiet uh, we can use our energy and our, our movement around the room to help with that and uh, Maddie says, before you begin to speak, take a little intake of breath. It subconsciously tells us someone's about to talk and there's less talking over each other. Love that, Maddie. And actually doing some work last night, I, somebody heard me go, <gasps> And then they said, oh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt and kind of carried on talking, but they knew that I wanted to say something. So that's spot on, Maddie. Love all of those things that you are saying. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, oh, and playing with the hair. Yeah, some people do that quite a lot. That can be a little bit annoying, but it's just about what's coming through from people, isn't it? What a good list from all of you. Thank you so much for all of that. And I want to um, take a step um, towards this virtual classroom area. Many of us are working in this area now. Some of us reluctantly, uh, some of us with a bit more enthusiasm. And, and our virtual classroom, the way we define this is it's a much smaller number of attendees. So we are definitely in webinar territory today. There's a couple of hundred of us. But a virtual classroom is usually maybe 10 people or up to 10 people. If you have up to about 30, we just call that a large virtual classroom. 30 plus, the way that we run our sessions, the activities that we do, the way we interact with people, that's getting much more into webinar territory, even though it's only 30 or 40 people. Ahead of one of this series of webinars that Matt mentioned, we asked attendees about how comfortable and confident they felt about delivering and planning live online learning. And as you can see here on this scale of zero to five, it's not that high. Uh, so we want to look at some of the specific challenges we might feel with this mo modality. So I've got another question for you to use in the chat, please. When we think about the attendees we have in our virtual classrooms, what challenges are there? Is it about their behaviour, our connection with them, the technology between us, or is it something else? What is it? Engagement, where to focus, distractions, lack of feedback, uh, system connections, disabled cameras, we'll come back to cameras. 
uh, the quiet ones, we can't pick up their signals, uh, observing learners, we can't see them, active work is in, uh, I'm not sure what that might mean, uh, so do tell us more in chat, uh, multitasking, lack of eye contact, lack of confidence, that could be our confidence in delivering this way, uh, the tech, the speaking over each other, uh, so speaking over each other, using the hand up and muting and unmuting and seeing that in a participant panel, that can be a way to get over that. Where to focus as we can't scan the room, we're going to talk about that. Uh, getting no questions from people, so a really good way to overcome that is get interaction from the very second people log in, get those questions planned really earlier on. Uh, you can't hear them if they're on mute, absolutely. Um, and uh, somebody's saying they can't hear me, so Mike, can you put some stuff in the chat to help uh, Hazel, please? Uh, you can't see what they're doing. So for process training, I don't know if they're doing the right thing. That can be really challenging. So that could be where webcams come in. It might be where you need to pe people in breakout rooms to share their screen if it's more about um, computer stuff. Uh, brain task, uh, multitasking and brain melting. I'll, I'll let you into a secret. It's not multitasking. It's task switching. I'm not saying your brain doesn't melt, but it is about task switching uh, and switching between things. Uh, attendees multitasking though. Yeah, the whole kind of second screen or up in the corner doing email. Uh, how to manage chat when you don't have a producer, says Dallas. Well, that's a really good question. Normally, in a virtual classroom, we don't have nearly 200 people, so it's less of an issue. Um, but that's something that you can try and deal with by building in time to look at chat. That's a really important one. Uh, being self-conscious, yeah, I'm really aware that I'm on camera. I don't want to scratch my nose or anything like that awkward silences and all sorts of other different things. So I'm really, um, really kind of aware of those things. I've had those same challenges myself. Um, okay, so we've got lots of different things kind of going on that we have to kind of um, deal with. Now in that survey ahead of a previous webinar, we asked attendees if they thought that the, the virtual was going to be the new normal. I know lots of us hate that term, but it's a good one because it kind of we understand it. And you can see the huge majority thought that it would be. Am I going to ask you about this as well? And the way I'd like you to answer is with the raise hand. Let's practice that now. So again, move your mouse on the screen, have a look at the bottom of your screen and you've got a raise hand icon. So if we were in a virtual classroom, uh, we might have like a green tick and I'd ask you to click that, but we're in a webinar today. So we've got that raise hand icon. Uh, so click on that just to give it a practice. Oh, I can see loads of you've got that. I, I can see the number tallying up on my screen and it's just going, really high okay brilliant guys so you most of you have found that that's fantastic and if you can't you can use chat that is no problem at all let's clear those so what about you most of the people in the survey thought that virtual events would become the new normal but what about you? Let's use that hand up icon if you're thinking, actually, yeah, I think so too. And if you, if you disagree, then you can keep your hand down. That's fine too. So do you think virtual events will become the new normal? Hand up if you're thinking, yeah, it's pretty inevitable with the way things are going at the moment. Uh, and I can see well over half of you have put your hand up and that's kind of still kind of creeping up. Uh, so we've got kind of a good number of you thinking that's going to be the case. We can get into discussions about, well, is that webinars? Is it virtual classrooms? Is it remote work? Uh, there's kind of some detail in there. But uh, Amala says, would be foolish to go backwards from the lessons learned in virtual delivery options. Love that point, Marla, completely with you. Okay, thank you very much for your responses there, everybody. Um, uh, and Maddie says it was already our normal, but you can't replace some face to face subjects. You're right. And we shouldn't do that. Just with COVID, we might have to be a bit creative at the moment. Thank you very much. So with this in mind, let's focus on the attendee view of the live um, of the live online facilitator. So basically, it's where you are right now in this webinar. And my question is, 
in virtual classrooms, what struggles do you think attendees have with their teachers and trainers? It could be their skill, attitude, what they deliver, or something else. So your view right now is the attendee view. What struggles are there with virtual facilitators? Uh, and I see uh, Anne, Anna Marie, you said about first aid training virtual. Um, I did attend a webinar actually on first aid training the other day. It's not the same as being there and somebody correcting you when you're, you're pressing on a, a chest of a dummy. But you know, it was a nice refresher nonetheless. So what struggles have we got? People, we get bored. Uh, there's a, a board trainer, that's terrible, isn't it? Distractions, too much talking and not enough interaction, fear of speaking, technology uh, gets in the way. Uh, Anne-Marie, first aid has to be face-to-face. -face. I definitely agree on the, all the practical stuff. Uh, it's new technology, it's hard to adapt not knowing when to speak, the pace can be too fast. Oh, Gillian, that's something I have to struggle with. Uh, whew, it's just relax, it's all pacey on this webinar. Uh, it's easy to slip into sarcasm. Yeah, right, Andy. Uh, you can't read the body language of, of their co-participants, uh, so that can be challenging. We can't see what's going on with other people. Uh, there's not enough interaction. We can have a lack of connection. I'm assuming you mean kind of with individuals and people. We're, we're being talked at. Don't we hate being talked at? There can be a lack of variety, the methodologies, the tools, for instance. It's easy um, for participants to do other things, not asking when you need to ask questions. All right, Anne-Marie, I'll slow down. Oh, okay. Um, you've just got so many great points here. So, oh, and Zoom fatigue, says Aileen. Yeah, uh, and Laura seconding Zoom fatigue. If you design things really well, and deliver them really well. You don't get so much of that Zoom fatigue. Uh, there was a group of us that ran an unconference, was it last week, I think? Um, and that was basically all day on Zoom. And the best feedback I thought at the end was people saying we didn't have Zoom fatigue, even though it was all day. So that was really awesome. Okay, so some brilliant um, points here about the perception of the role of the facilitator live online and what they bring. <laughs> or just don't bring uh, to sessions. And Laura says, just a week ago, yeah, no Zoom fatigue. Laura was there, she did an amazing job. So we're going to talk about this digital body language stuff as it can give us a really good model to deal with some of these challenges. And um, so I want to kind of highlight this is from Steve Woods. Now, Steve Woods is the chief technical officer at Nudge, and he developed the term digital body language back in 2009. Uh, it was all about marketing and sales. And Steve explains it as the aggregate of digital activity. Uh, but the key here is it's the aggregate for the individual, it's all of the data about that individual. It's not about the Google Analytics that you see across your whole website. It's about what one person is doing. So Matt, can you tell us a little bit more please about your perspective on digital body language? And Matt, we've done that typical thing of you're on mute. <laughs> We have to do it. If it's not me, it's going to be you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Too many buttons. I think that uh, that reference to marketing is helpful as a starting point um, because it's something that we we all experience and we can relate to. Um, marketing realized that selling through the web meant that uh, they couldn't see the buyer. So it can't read their buying signals, can't make adjustments, uh, can't serve properly. So. So they needed to build tools into the website or into an email campaign so that they can get to know the person what they're, you know, by what they're clicking on, what white papers they're downloading, samples they've requested, you know, trials signed up for, emails opened or deleted, whatever the case may be. And I think this picture that's on the screen is really helpful as we think about digital body language. Um, I think it's about acknowledging that you can't see the person and so you need to allow their digital activity to help you create a picture of, of who that person is and so that you can serve them better and adjust to their needs. So I think what we'll talk about today is how we as trainers can plan for that 
and build tools into our virtual sessions so that we can effectively read the room and then and be ready to adjust accordingly. Yeah, I think that's such a great point. And, and as you say, that picture kind of really summarizes it. And, and we can apply this concept of digital body language uh, to communication because using this approach takes the idea of people that we can't see and turns them back into humans again. Now, Matt mentioned the, the marketing measure of whether someone's opened an email, for example. Now, in a virtual classroom, what we might use is that green tick. How many people have clicked the green tick uh, or maybe the red X for in answer to a question? Another tool that we might use as a facilitator rather than a marketeer could be maybe the polling, either for interest, experience or assessment. And so at this point, obviously, I have to use a poll. It's, it's kind of the, the, uh, the thing to do. So what I've got is uh, a question for you. What features of your virtual classroom platform do you like using? Now, you should be able to click as many of those as you like. Uh, so which ones do you like using in your virtual classroom sessions uh, or maybe plan to use in the future if you're, if you're just starting out? Now, I can see uh, the polling is just going crazy at the moment. Uh, so have a think. Click as many that apply and uh, and then click submit and i'll give you a few moments and we'll see what comes through and see what's top for everyone what's the virtual whiteboard somebody asks me uh, so the virtual whiteboard is all about kind of using annotation tools we're not doing it in the webinar today but it's using drawing tools uh, to highlight something or it could be a text tool or it could be an arrow something like that uh, somebody asked me is body language or facial expressions. So, so that might come under webcam. If you have people on webcams, uh, it might be um, under, uh, what else might it be? It might come under using the emoticons or the feedback icons. Now, some of you are saying you can't see the poll. Really sorry about that. Uh, what I'm going to do is just pop a list into chat of the different things, just so you can see the list of what people uh, were voting on. And I am sharing the results now. So what's come top? Top is chat. My favourite. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, also, loads of you using breakout rooms, polling, uh, webcam for uh, the facilitator. We'll come back to that. Uh, so that all of you are using loads of it. Some are using video and audio. We've got some video today uh, and third party tools as well. Absolutely brilliant. I'm so pleased to see so many of you uh, using those different things um, because I think it's really important that we use all of these different tools available to us. So I've turned off that poll now that should have disappeared. Uh, and Sam's sharing some some different things as well, like VWall or Jamboard. They're really good, too. So then why use these tools? We've got them, you use them, you seem to love some of the same ones that I do, but why use them? So tell me in chat, please, what's the reason you use these different ways for people to engage? So we, we make it interactive. Um, Chris is saying, I'm surprised that emoticons and feedbacks is only kind of half the people. That could be to do with the tech. Maybe some tech doesn't have that, Chris. Maybe some people don't find it as useful. Uh, engagement, uh, prompt and action, um, social experience in breakout rooms. We keep people's attention. Uh, great ideas and experience shared. You start a conversation. It wakes the delegates up. Uh, make sure they're getting value. It can be fun. It can enhance certain points uh, to, to stimulate, uh, to communicate. It's engaging to get over the emotional gap you miss from being face to face. It keeps things human, changes their focus. It avoids the monologue. Um, to make learning two directional, that's really important. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, I use music and icebreakers and energizers. Sounds great fun. Helps people feel supported and listened to. Uh, it's active learning rather than passive. It makes people feel special and helps them learn the tech. Great point, Becky loads of lovely stuff in that chat and it adds variety it creates virtual safety amazing stuff 
And most of your answers fall broadly into these three categories of, of getting to know the group and individuals, feedback from them and their learning, and keeping them focused, engaged and present. It's all really important. There is another level that these interactions work at, and this is the key to being really effective as a virtual facilitator. And that's about using these interactions in place of our face-to-face -face facilitation techniques. The way to think about this is to deconstruct what you normally do face-to-face -face and rebuild it into the virtual environment. So face to face, I look around the room and look at people's reactions. Is Bob leaning forward, looking intently? Is Alice, has she got a frown? Is she maybe need some more explanation for something? And so on. But I can't do that in my virtual classroom. Live online, I might start with a closed question using the agree, disagree icons to get a sense of people. And this is a version of reading the room. I use other tools to get more and more information from people. Um, and this is all about replacing what I'm missing out on in physical body language. So this is really about understanding our craft face to face so that we can use the tools available to us to design and facilitate live online. And where we can't look around the room and interpret people's physical responses, we are able to use the tools in our platform to build in those opportunities. So what we've got here, what I might start with is a closed question for people. They answer green tick, red X, get an understanding of where they are on a learning topic. And people that selected one answer, perhaps the tick, I might ask them to add a bit more in chat. Uh, perhaps those that answered no, I'd ask to contribute to a follow up question on the whiteboard. Uh, from there, we maybe unmute microphones, hear what people are saying. We've got their tone of voice and so on. It helps uh, build relationships if we may be going to breakout rooms and look at those things further. Uh, so also what we might need to kind of be aware of is that we want to design activities outside of our platform. Some of you have mentioned things already like Jamboard, absolutely great fun, uh, that Google product. And um, especially if you're using a platform that feels a little bit more limited, maybe doesn't have quite as many tools, uh, external applications like Menti, Jamboard, Brio, Padlet, and a million others can be really good. And at Action, what they did is they designed a specific activity based on the TV show Cash Drop. So Matt, let's get you back on screen again. And can you talk us through this video please because i'd really love to know a bit more about the cash drop um, activity and how this worked at action uh, and what it is that you designed so matt over to you yes well this is a version of a, a kind of game engine that we created it's just kind of an unbranded version that we're looking at here but we've used it for product knowledge for um, global pharma and different uh, different organizations but basically the facilitator shares a link into the breakout rooms or individuals into their chat. And then those individuals or groups are presented with uh, questions under some time pressure. Uh, and they may need to work with their team in the breakout room to decide the correct answer and how confident they are in their choice. It's just a fun way of getting people into a, a quiz uh, in a virtual session. Yeah, and you can see all the results here and, and uh, that's coming up. And now let's have a look at this facilitator view. Tell us about this, Matt. Yeah, so the facilitator is kind of the game master and they're serving up the next question, uh, but they also see people's answers as they come in. So the different, you'll see the different participants lighting up and where they've put the different jewels. So they can kind of pace the game according to how quickly people are answers. If everybody's committed their answers, they can go ahead and move to the next one or they can slow things down and give updates and, and kind of score rankings, leaderboard. Uh, so the facilitator is able to read the room and engagement through, through those interactions. Thank you, Matt. Some really great stuff there. And I love just seeing the cleanliness of that and, uh, and I helped uh, Action with just one, one instance of that. And it was really good fun to go through and play that game. 
and uh, I just wanted to have a look for a moment at this facilitator view and what you saw on that video is a really good example of, of using the data and the tech in order to make an informed decision about your facilitation because as Matt said you can kind of move on more quickly or, or you're getting feedback of like huh everybody's taking ages to decide on this question what does that say about their learning and their understanding and from this you can start inferring a little bit more and adapting and tailoring what it is that you want to do in your session so this is about how i react to things and the options that we have in the design but also the flexibility in the facilitation as well let's go back to this idea that we have um, being able to read the room in different ways to get that learning feedback to get to know individuals and use interactions in place of the face-to-face -face facilitation techniques that we have let's say we've asked a question about a topic and we've got people to use either the green tick or the red X to answer, to agree or disagree. Now, six out of our eight virtual classroom attendees have clicked one or the other, but two haven't clicked yet. How do you deal with the two that haven't clicked? What are some ideas you can put into chat? How could you deal with the two that haven't clicked, either agree or disagree yet? How do you deal with that? We could ask if they need more time, ask the virtual room who hasn't selected either yet. And we could remind them using a screenshot of where to find those, they might have forgotten. Remind everyone to click. We could just move on, it might not be important. Uh, I'd say we just have two more left to vote. Uh, do they understand the question? Ask them verbally remind them how to do it, ask them if they need support, show that you've noticed they haven't responded, maybe repeat the question, encourage them diplomatically, ask if they're all ready, that diplomatically bit is really important. Uh, maybe rephrase the question, ask and remind everyone, ask if they've got tech issues or if they need more time. Uh, encourage them, give them some clues as to what you're asking, ask if they've forgotten to press submit if it was a poll for example uh, so you've got some really great options there um, and it, it's, uh, it might be that we realize that people just aren't there and we have to move on these are all really great suggestions or we could private message them to see if they're okay and ask them this is a great point about the delivery skills you already have and their application to the virtual classroom. There will be some things that are more or less appropriate depending on the topic, the culture, the people, and you and your style uh, of delivery as well. Uh, and Dallas says create an engagement game. I'm really liking that, that sounds good. Um, uh, Gail, I've seen your question. Uh, you say about the resource, uh, you're asking a question about the resource that was shown to the poll people. I'm not quite sure on your question. If you ask that to all panelists, I'm sure Mike or Sarah or someone will respond to you. The point of this is we've got options when we're in virtual classrooms uh, with regards to our teaching or our facilitation practice. And speaking of options, one of those options is the webcam. So let's use that hand up icon, please. How many of you like your attendees to have their webcam on during your virtual classroom sessions? So hands up, please. So hands up, how many of you like to have your attendee webcams on during virtual classrooms? Lots of you, well over half of you like to have uh, people on. Uh, some of you are saying in chat, it's fine if it's less than 10 uh, at certain times, but not all the time. So, so that's kind of my next question really, is what's the advantage of that? Why do so many of us like our attendee webcams on? Uh, Marla says, I like it, but it slows down the bandwidth, so often have them off and on. So that's a really good point. Uh, we like to see their faces. Not many colleagues have uh, webcams. It's great for introductions, not all the time. You can see that they're actually there. 
read their facial expressions, see if they're engaged, check their engagement. Uh, you like to see their faces. It feels like you're not talking to yourself. Yeah, I look at the webcam and I can see my video thing and it's just like, am I just talking to myself on video? Have I finally gone mad? Um, it's so that they feel included. It feels like they're with you. Uh, it's more comfortable and it's closer to that facilitation face to face and that's a bit more traditional. Uh, you can see their actions, read their faces, uh, you can show a video and would ask them to turn, uh, oh sorry, if you're showing a video, ask them to turn off their webcam. Um, it personalizes the experience and you can read um, and see if people are comfortable and so on absolutely great oh and adapt to their unspoken needs thank you christine so some really good kind of uh, things here now i agree with all those things they they're really useful and we can feel more connected with people it's more of what we're accustomed to however there are some really good reasons that you've mentioned about bandwidth or, or not having a webcam and also there might be just personal reasons that people don't want to or can't have their webcam on and we have to um, we have to be aware of that and and very much kind of make sure that we respect that so we shouldn't in my opinion insist on people having their webcams on and what I do is I use other tools that are available to me and then webcams are a bonus, which is absolutely amazing. So what about for the facilitator? So let's use your hands up again. Hands up if you have your webcam on at least some of the time in your sessions. Maybe not all of it, maybe it is, but at least some of the time in your sessions as a facilitator. Uh, and Sonia, I know there's been some conversation going on and you're saying that webcams can be distracting. Uh, so that's a really good point about actually a really good reason sometimes for not having the webcam on as a facilitator is it can be distracting. Uh, but loads of you are um, having your webcams on. It can be great again for that communication, for that connection, to see a real person. Um, but the disadvantage is, is bandwidth and you know the, uh, the distraction as well can be a bit of a challenge. So thank you very much. Now at Action, uh, there was an interesting effect when, uh, when facilitators were using the webcam. So Matt, could you please tell us a little bit more about this? Yes. Um, so we, we've noticed really a, a, a positive difference in engagement when, um, from the delegates when the facilitator has their webcam on. Um, the, the participants seem more engaged uh, when, when the facilitator is engaged and maybe standing up, has a, has a decent background, whatever. The people who are attending seem more attentive and involved and we've noticed that across a number of of sessions and i certainly know from my own experience of seeing my my own daughter start uh, a levels some of that content is now being delivered online and she says there's a big difference between you know a kind of a disembodied voice doing a voiceover over a powerpoint and someone a, a teacher who's able to gesture and emphasize and use use real body language to emphasize a point. Yeah, and I, I think that's all amazing points. And it, it kind of goes back to this point we discussed at the beginning, which is we have to consider how attendees feel about the virtual sessions, don't you, Matt? Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that. And, and, and it really brings that to life, I think. And this moves me into our last topic of today, and which is how to really kind of think about this from um, from a design point of view. Uh, Jerry, you ask about virtual background or real background, depends what's behind you. If you've got something kind of that looks okay, go real. Um, but if you've got like beds and stuff like that, and it's not so good, then you know, the virtual backgrounds can be really good. You just have to get the lighting uh, good. Uh, and Keena says, I like seeing bookcases, it can be good fun. So first of all, uh, this kind of idea of a marketing campaign that Matt talked about a little bit earlier on. Um, for this webinar, we surveyed people to find out about your struggles, about your successes. And from that, we know that a lot of you survey your attendees ahead of time for your own sessions, or that you speak to them on the phone, you liaise with clients or stakeholders or managers, 
to find out more about your learners before they arrive, which are all really good examples and things to do. Now, the Brio Learning Management System has some nice features for this too. Uh, Matt, what does this screen grab show us? Yeah, so built right into Brio for the facilitator is a kind of quick access to the resources that I might want to provide to delegates during a Zoom or a WebEx session. So I just, I quickly copy the resource link, paste it into the chat uh, for everyone or broadcast it into breakout rooms. And then each person has their own link. They're popping up their own browser window to interact with that survey or assessment. And then as the facilitator, I can see the live responses coming back in. Names are lighting up um, as people complete. And then I can click to view uh, the live results as well. So I can see the actual answers that people gave. I can even get a, a sentiment analysis um, that, that looks at the free text questions and, and analyzes the tone of the language. So I can instantly get that feedback. Um, I think another key is that all of this response data is then in the learning management system and can contribute to the completion of the course as opposed to just running a poll like we, like we did earlier or a quiz and then that data uh, sitting in the in the kind of virtual virtual platform it comes in and can actually contribute to the compliance or completion of the course and that that's quite exceptional as a feature to brio isn't it yeah, I th we're, we're trying to do all that we can to support learning and development professionals who've moved into this virtual session delivery and trying to make the LMS really support that well. So we've developed a lot of unique features that, that kind of integrate uh, deeply in with Zoom and WebEx and, and other platforms. Ah, okay, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, most of those kind of virtual classroom platforms, you can save the poll data, for example, like you say, for assessment or compliance. Um, but the integration back into the LMS, I really like that kind of uh, part there. Um, and there's a question in, uh, in chat for, for the Brio guy. So Matt, I think that's you or Sarah can answer that. So I shall leave you to that in chat. And um, all of these options are really important um, that we have because our sessions aren't just a series of quick interactions for the sake of dragging people out of their email. Uh, now there was a, a question in the question and answer section I noticed about distractions for the delegates and partly things like click the green tick, it drags people back to you. But actually this is much more from my point of view about the whole activities and engaging them. Because if you are building learning activities and at the easiest point, a quick interaction like that green tick or red X for yes or no, and then you build on that with other kind of things that you've got going on, other tools like chat, for instance, or maybe you're asking people to voice their opinions and maybe longer activities like breakout rooms or the surveys or Jamboard or any of those other uh, different things that you've got that we've been discussing. What we're doing is we're building those activities to engage people and then there's less of them being distracted. Uh, and as per the comment in that question that was asked in the Q&A section, we do have to, to some point, respect that these are adult learners and they're doing what they want to do and i always say to people if you need to be in your email if that's your priority go for it but i'm going to do my best to make it really hard for you to leave my session uh, maddie you've asked about length uh, of virtual classrooms mike will share a link in chat about kind of some numbers we've got for virtual classrooms uh, but i agree with uh, corinne three hours maximum uh, with uh, with breaks most of our sessions are about two hours with a 10 minute break in the middle but they can be an hour they they can be you know we did the unconference that was all day but that was a lots of different activities and things going on in breaks okay uh, so some really good stuff here and what i'd like to kind of move on to is ask you a question about flexibility in your virtual classroom and what challenges you have with that um, so it could be about the limits you have the, with the technology, your ability to respond to an audience and so on. So a lot of us are really happy face to face, kind of ebbing and flowing and adjusting to what's going on across a morning or a day or whatever it might be. 
but what about in the virtual classroom? What challenges are there to being flexible with your delivery? So in chat, <laughs> Russell says, there's always one that has technical issues. You are right, Russell, there is always one. Um, and if you have a producer, that can be really good. Someone like Mike uh, can help with that. You might not have that. So having a document, you can copy and paste technical notes, that will help you out with that too. Uh, limited budget for the tech. Uh, there's lots of free stuff out there, Chris, which can be good, but I do hear you about the limited budget. Uh, going off piste to follow a line of conversation, that's my favourite thing to do. Uh, and Michael helps me to keep on time and I, I constantly hear from him, you're two minutes behind <laughs> the plan. Uh, and I work with one producer who will just tell me to giddy up. So uh, yeah, it can be challenging to keep focused. And that comes back a little bit to the design and what's important for the learners. Sometimes off piste is where you need to go. You often have shorter time scales. You might have a couple of hours in your virtual classroom rather than all day. Again, this comes back to design. What do we fit into that two hours? Uh, Amanda says, I'm writing the session, but have to rely on someone else to deliver. Really important point there, Amanda. And what Mike's going to do is share in the chat our facilitator guide template which you know you might be sorted but it might be something to help because it can really help them kind of stay focused and know what the timing is that you're planning uh jumping to what's important for a group so it might be that you need to switch around your slides um if you're using slides or your activities and this can be knowing your tech or like how can I pause sharing and jump to a different slide or in Zoom uh, or use whatever technology it is you've got to be able to do that? Uh, sharing screens seamlessly to stay professional. That's a really good one. Um, if you've got Adobe Connect, you can use layouts. Uh, WebEx, you can use the different tabs. Um, and if you're using Zoom, rather than stop sharing and start sharing, you can start a new share to switch between things. And that's really nice and seamless there. Uh, the classroom needs to be highly structured with regards to time, but also needs to be flexible to allow for intermittent bathroom breaks or leg stretches. Yeah, especially uh, kind of sitting at our desks, we all need a little bit more of that. Uh, not having a timekeeper, you can put um, for timekeeping, you can put maybe on your phone, um, maybe an app, for instance, that can help you with your, uh, with your work. So I was doing something last night, for instance, where timing was really important in a webinar. And so I just had this timer on my phone. So I knew kind of for each section where we were at. And it's gigantic. It was just a free one I, I went and downloaded. So something like that could help you too. Okay, uh, so what other challenges is it that we're having? Uh, Marlis has been comfortable with the different controls in whatever platform you're working with. Absolutely. Uh, and Keena's loving my props. Thank you, Keena. Uh, you should see the array of rubbish I have on my desk. Okay, so we do definitely have some of these challenges uh, to us, but we do need to make sure that where possible, we're building our knowledge and our experience to be flexible. And Nigel, knowing your tech, that's a key one, because if we're not sure about the tech, that's going to be first and foremost in our mind, and we're going to be less able to be flexible with what's going on. So you're all highlighting key issues that people are struggling, struggling with, including, as you've just said, Nigel, knowing the features you've got available in your platform and how to use them. It could be that the design of the session just doesn't have enough variety of different activities. You've all said about time constraints in already very full sessions where perhaps resources or, or a blended approach hasn't been designed or used enough for whatever reason and experience of virtual delivery itself and being able to deal with the mixture of classroom management, technology, and this new digital feedback, this digital body language that we're talking about. Something definitely to take away from this webinar today is that your current facilitation skills are really valuable in the virtual classroom. Matt, can you tell us a bit more about this, please? Yeah, I think one thing that we all know is important to facilitation is sometimes uh, getting out of the way. You know, sometimes too much facilitation can be a 
can be the barrier and barrier to engagement. So we've got uh, examples with, uh, with a particular client um, uh, where in breakout rooms, people were quiet and not interacting as much when the facilitator was present. So they decided to pull back, pull back the facilitators out of the breakout rooms, give that group some space so that they had to step up um, in the breakout rooms and and kind of and interact. They took ownership for themselves, had their discussion, took responsibility for for feeding back to the rest of the group. So it's just that it's those same things that we know in the physical space. We just need to bring them into the virtual. Thank you, Matt. I think sharing that kind of real life example is so important because we're used to doing this face to face. So we need to make sure that we try and apply those same things. And Sonia says, don't panic at the silences. Such an important point, Sonia. And so often I'm telling people, just ask the question and give people time because like any question, you need time to process it. Uh -huh. You need time to think, well, how am I going to answer? Is it chat? Am I going to put my hand up to speak? And then you just need to actually type things out. And silence is a great time to check your notes. Actually breathe. Take your last sip of coffee. Um, and make sure that you are kind of feeling okay within yourself. So that silence is okay. If it's silence mid-sentence, that's not okay. But give people time to go and answer things. Absolutely brilliant here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as Sarah says, uh, so many people are chatting away trying to answer the question, but on mute. <laughs> yeah, that quite often happens. It's so easy. I do it more often than I care to tell you as well. Okay, so that uh, was a really great um, thing to share, Matt, thank you. And it's a lovely way to round off our content today. So I want to summarize our session, but we are, we are not done. We've still got some more questions and things to discuss. Uh, and I want to go into question times with you. So you've got that question and answer section uh, on the uh, Zoom webinar to go and have a look at. So we discussed how virtual classrooms are much more normal now than they were even at the beginning of this year. A few things have been going on this year. Uh, that digital body language, that term um, from Steve Woods, is all about individuals and that using the tools we have available is about the attendees as well as helping us to consider our face-to-face -face skills, of which we've got years and years of them, um, and how we can use those and break those down and use interactions to get closer to the connections that we have face-to-face. -face. What tools is it we can use, including external tools, looking at how people are using those, um, that we give them, how we can interpret what it is that they're doing and what that means about their learning. And to use all of these things to build activities for learning and helping us understand what our attendees, what people need from us in our facilitation. Okay, so let's move on to some questions. It might get a little bit busy here, so I might be calling on my crack team to help me out. Uh, Rachel in, um, in the chat, you've sent that to all panellists. If you want that publicly, uh, please also send that uh, to all panellists and attendees. You do also have the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Uh, what's the best way to practice your delivery, asks Rebecca. Uh, so partly on your own, um, just kind of reading things out and getting comfortable with PowerPoint notes, you know, wherever things are. Partly if you've got another device or another computer, I've got um, a little kind of dinky old uh, computer here. It's, it literally was a couple of hundred quid off of eBay. Uh, so that can be really useful to have the attendee view and I can click on my screen and go, all right, that's what's happened. Uh, so you can do some of that. Mum and dad, colleagues, brothers, sisters, um, getting people to kind of practice with um, and maybe forming a little group. Maybe you can form a group from this webinar today. Uh, also, we've got, will we share the presentation? The presentation will be in the recording. I don't tend to share the presentation because I think the value is in what we've discussed and what I've delivered, not in, in the pretty pictures. 
Uh, Sonia says about the balance. Um, Ahmed says you're a great facilitator. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, Russell says in terms of dress code, should you dress corporately or as everyone knows you're at home and probably have slippers on is smart casual acceptable depends entirely on your audience uh, so uh, i've gone kind of smart casual today um, other times i'm a bit more kind of jacket suit collar something like that really depends on your audience you will know that best uh, pauline says how do you all deal with interactivity and recording sessions for people who can't attend i have the feeling people are less responsive then do you agree so definitely they're going to be less responsive if they can't if they're you know if they're not there they're going to be less responsive in the session but maybe you mean they're less responsive across the whole of what it is that you're trying to do um, i'm not quite sure about that i would say with regards recording sessions again it depends on on the organization the culture and, and so on some people absolutely do not record their sessions you have to be there live and that's the point of it I like recording the sessions because you never know when there's going to be a tech fail uh, or somebody has a last minute issue that really isn't their fault and they can catch up and it's a million times better than just here are the slides. Um, oh, Pauline says I meant the attendees feeling they're recorded uh, and saying less. So again, that depends a bit on the organisation uh, and what's being discussed, what the topic is and what you're using the recording for. So most of our sessions, we record them, but it's only for the eight, 10 people, whoever it is that are there. So it doesn't go up on YouTube, then managers don't see it, that kind of thing. But that depends on, on the intention. You have to set that um, up ahead. Uh, so let me go to the question and answer panel and, and see what we've got. Uh, Joanne says, any tips on digital presence with webcam? Um, I'd say definitely looking into the webcam. I'm looking at the webcam. I'm not looking at me. I'm not looking at the chat. Um, making sure that you've kind of mid, mid chest upwards, that you're not too kind of low down, things like that. There's loads of stuff. If you Google webcam advice, there's loads of good stuff on the internet to go and find out about that. Uh, I'm going to answer a couple more questions. Uh, so Elise says, some participants suggested I could run a virtual classroom like a normal classroom, standing up, writing on a flip chart. I'm willing to try this a bit. However, I don't think a virtual classroom is a translation. Activities and attitudes are different. Yes, you can do that. Should you do it? Some people do it really well. Um, but if you're kind of turning around and writing on a flip chart, is that the best thing? Are you going to miss something in chat? Um, I think you would be better off looking at what can your technology do as an equivalent of that um, would be my suggestion. Uh, and Kina says the video used today worked really well over Zoom, but I've seen some that really struggled on other platforms, so I rarely use them. Any advice? So the video that we had was embedded in PowerPoint. That works great on Zoom, not necessarily on other things. One of the big things is get your bit rate down. That's the quality, like the megapixels in a picture, um, and that will make it a little bit smoother to load. Okay, I know there are other questions there. We don't have time to get to those right now. We do need to finish off because what I'd like to do is ask you today, please, what is it that you have learned? What are you taking away from today's session? What is your light bulb moment from today? So in chat, please, what is your light bulb moment? Uh, there was a question here about dealing with distractions, uh, a little bit of chill out, they're adult learners, let them do that, what they want. But if you design and deliver a really engaging session with loads of questions, loads of activities that are valuable and useful, that will really help. What have we learned today? Using external tools, mix up interaction, define the facilitator role, interactive quiz through Brio, that looked fantastic. My current skills will translate into a virtual classroom. Task switching, not multitasking. The need to practice. Uh, hold up cards, simple yet brilliant. It can be really good fun. Uh, how important the facilitator is, use more interactions. Um, great tone of voice, smile and enthusiasm. 
build on interactions not just have them throughout use tools to read the room and loads more that's absolutely brilliant keep those coming um, and we would like to do some more of this we would like uh, you to contribute to industry learning by telling us about your virtual experiences we've got a short research survey about digital body language where you can share your insights on the topic and we're gathering information from across the L&D sector and we'll share those responses with everyone who takes part and Mike's going to share that link in chat for you it will also be available later and we have resources for you stuff that we've talked about today it's all in the chat Mike is going to share the link for you the follow-up survey and all of the uh, information and links that are available so oh gosh you've been amazing today and on behalf of Mike and I at Lightbulb Moment and Matt and the Acteon and the Brion team thank you so much for your time today thank you so much for your questions and thank you so much for your interaction we hope to see you soon bye bye <laughs>